Good morning, everyone. So we are starting in on chapter 13. Lucky chapter 13, in fact. Well, I don't know. Uh, we're going to start by reviewing some stuff for you guys today, mostly because, like I said earlier when the video thing wasn't on, I think I lectured more about it in chapter 11 than I normally do, and so really the beginning part of this will be pretty good review. So the weakest attractive force is London dispersion forces. You guys remember what those are? Owen oh, has to remember what those are. Yes. So this is the weakest attractive force. But it, it's a somewhat important one because all molecules have it. And what happens is if there's no other stronger attractive forces, then we you know, say that something has London dispersion forces and that's what matters. And if there's any stronger attractive force, we tend to ignore the London dispersion forces just because they're so small compared to anything else. And they're proportional to the size, oops, I guess I forgot the little proportional symbol, proportional to the size of the molecule. So the bigger a molecule is, the larger the London dispersion forces are. So for instance, if I just take, say, methane, which is a nice small molecule, and I kind of you know, compare it versus, say, something that's got a bunch more carbon strung together, like this. And you'll learn what these are second semester, because these are really organic chemistry molecules. But you guys are at least kind of familiar with them, and we can use them as examples. So this one is methane. And here, I'm actually going to chop the carbon off, because you guys won't know that one. But you will know this one. You guys heard of butane? Yeah, what's butane used in? Yeah, it's used in lighters. And then a shorthand notation. I'm not going to draw the molecule all the way out. So each of these, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And so there's hydrogens around all of these points, and they just represent the carbons. And so basically, we're lazy enough to not bother drawing the carbons. And don't worry about it. If you just want to write the name of the molecule down, you can. But the idea is that this is a series of molecules that only have London dispersion forces because they're nonpolar molecules. And we know that methane, for instance, is a gas at room temperature, right? And we know butane is a liquid at room temperature. It's kind of at that liquid gas interface. And then eight carbons is octane. And that is a liquid. That's a what kind of basically gasoline is, essentially. Yeah, this is, all of them are symmetrical molecules. All of them are nonpolar. All of them don't have any asymmetric distribution of charge, and so they're all examples. What I'm trying to point out is that as the molecule gets larger, we go from a gas to a liquid to a liquid, and then past uh, that, if you go up to about, say, so this would be like C20, there'd be, what, H22 on there? That's a solid you know, at room temperature. I don't know what the name of it is. But the idea being that the bigger the molecule is, the stronger the intermolecular forces. And so the more tightly bound those molecules are to each other. And so at room temperature, methane has very, very weak intermolecular forces. It's a gas. And then, you know, as we get to butane that has a bit stronger intermolecular force that holding the molecules next to each other, then it turns into a liquid and, you know, octane. And then eventually, you know, even London dispersion forces, if you have a large enough molecule, are, you know, large enough to make the molecule just be a solid at room temperature. And so one of the things we're going to go through next is kind of that idea of why things are solids, liquids, and gases. And of course, intermolecular forces are what holds at least molecular compounds together. Uh, let's see. I guess for completeness sake, and I know I drew the picture, but what the hell? Apparently, you guys need it again. Just kidding. Um, remember, we kind of draw intermolecular forces as dotted lines. So that's my intermolecular force. And it's not a bond. We're not sharing electrons. It's just a, in this case, a weak, elect or weak attractive force. 
And in the cases of dipole-dipole, hydrogen bonding, and ionic, it really is just electrostatic, meaning it's the idea that opposites, or that opposites attract, basically. OK, the second attractive force you guys should remember is dipole-dipole. And we're not going to go through what DD stands for, because as all give me silly answers anyway. And this is due to an asymmetric distribution of charge. And that leads to a polar, or sometimes it's referred to as a dipolar molecule. And so the idea is that we know opposites attract. And so that tiny asymmetric distribution of charge between some end of the molecule that's positive and some end of the molecule that's negative is enough to attract them together, kind of like little miniature magnets. You know, here's a north pole and here's a south pole. There's an attractive force between them. Uh, it's proportional to the size of the dipoles, which since we don't know or how to calculate those, we're just going to treat most of them as being the same. And so we won't worry about any true nitty gritty details as to which dipole is bigger than another dipole. A good example of this is this molecule here has a nice little dipole. The oxygen in the molecule, because it's the most electronegative, is slightly positive and the hydrogen end of the molecule is slightly positive because hydrogen is the least electronegative, has the smallest value. And the idea is that that oxygen atom can be attracted to the hydrogen atoms of a, another dipole. And you know that one can be attracted to the oxygen of another one. And so what happens is all of these molecules can begin to sort of uh, congregate, meaning if there's a strong attractive force between them, then they're going to be attracted to each other and they're going to behave kind of like a liquid. If we had enough energy, of course, we can turn a liquid into a gas because we give the molecules enough energy that they can overcome those intermolecular attractive forces. And then eventually when we get to the stronger forces or the strongest forces, we'll realize that you know a lot of those are responsible for making things solids at room temperature because they Intermolecular forces are so strong, they literally just hold the molecule together and you can't break it apart very easily. Let's see. Yeah, we got everything there. So, like I said, it's a little bit of review, but that's okay. It'll either show up on the chapter 11, to 10 and 11 test, or the 13 and 14, or who knows, maybe both, because I like it so much. So, hydrogen bonding is, of course, our next. And just to, as a reminder, bonding does not mean, in this case, sharing electrons. It's just a poor choice of name. And so it's an unfortunate choice. And this is a large or a special case of dipole-dipole. Where hydrogen bonded to oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine forms an extra strong, about 10 times as strong, dipole-dipole uh, interaction. And it's one of the things that's responsible for the unique properties of water. So water is a really good example of dipole-dipole interactions. And those waters can, oops, what's wrong with that picture before I erase it? That's a horrible picture. No, hydrogen's perfectly fine with one bond to oxygen, but what's wrong with that picture? So don't obviously write it down, because I'm going to erase it. No, O should be. Yeah, notice I drew the dotted things between the two hydrogens, right? Hydrogen's not attracted to hydrogen. That'd be silly. That'd be like looking in the mirror and going, hey. OK, we'll stop that. It's going to be attracted to the oxygen. So a partial negative there, a partial positive. You know, and that hydrogen might be connected to or at least attracted to a second oxygen or on a different molecule. 
And of course, you know, depending upon how we draw these, we can, I suppose, get a pretty good love triangle going on, kind of like a soap opera, maybe. Uh, let's see. What else do we want to mention? Oh, I don't know if I... Uh, this is the bad thing about my notes sometimes. I know I have the values written somewhere, but I just don't know where. Um, we'll kind of sketch the graph out. I think it's the data is actually in your book. And so if we take a look at sort of molecular weight versus boiling point or melting point. And so I won't put any numbers on the graph. And so we're going to look at a series of compounds. And if we look over here, this is going to be, well, actually, we'll start it down a little lower. TEH2. And then, let's see, this would be SH2. Oh, you think I'd have a periodic table every day. What's, is there, there's one element between tellurium and sulfur, isn't there, that I'm missing this morning? Someone's got a periodic table and is prepared, right? That's the one I'm missing, right? Selenium. So there's SEH2, there's SH2. So what's a like about these molecules? Yeah. And they, they, they all have this structure. They all look like water, basically. And then notice that tellurium is the heaviest, right? And this one is going to be the lightest so far. And so notice that as the molecules get lighter, the boiling points and melting points get less and less because the intermolecular forces get weaker and weaker. And then you have water over here. And so water is an anomaly, meaning it's a very small molecule. Therefore, we really should expect it to have a very low melting point and boiling point. We really should expect, the, you know, without hydrogen bonding, it um, to be kind of that low. But due to the hydrogen bonding, due to that special character of oxygen being very highly electronegative and small, and hydrogen being very small, that that is anomalous. So if we take a look at it, and I guess maybe I'll erase boiling point. We'll put melting point over here. So this is 0 degrees Celsius, right? If you look at it, water should be, you know, and put it in quotes, we know it's not really there. Somewhere about minus 150 degrees Celsius, if I think, would be where water melts. So without hydrogen bonding, without that attractive force, uh, life on Earth wouldn't be possible. All the water on Earth would be frozen. But because of that hydrogen bonding, then all the water on Earth at this temperature is liquid and life can thrive. Well, at least it's liquid for a while longer, hopefully. I don't know, it's getting kind of cold out. It may start being a solid for the most part. Okay, the last attractive force is ionic bonding. And that really is between two atoms with full charges. So remember that little delta symbol means partial. It means it's not as strong as just having a bare pro or a plus charge and a minus charge. Classic example is NaCl, although really any ionic compound works. And it's the strongest simply because it's the bare plus and minus charges. Now, there are all sorts of fringe cases. For instance, you can have, and we'll kind of talk about, uh, you know, where you can mix up things. So if you have something dissolved in water, it's got a weak dipole, then it can interact with that water. Uh, not as strongly as if it was two water molecules, but it certainly does kind of interact pretty easily. So, uh, and then, like for instance, one of the reasons that sodium dissolves so well in water is that if sodium's a positive charge, and oxygens, so actually here, this is, I don't know why, I should have just started a new slide. So this is, for instance, an example of an ion hydrogen bond interaction. So meaning we can mix up sort of these intermolecular forces. And so one of the reasons that ionic compounds dissolve so well in water 
is because that hydrogen ion or that sodium ion can be surrounded by a bunch of water molecules that form sort of those hydrogen bonds or that ion dipole interaction. And same thing with the chlorine, except in the chlorine's case, the waters are going to orient their hydrogens towards it because the hydrogens have that partial positive charge. And so what happens when you dissolve ionic compounds in water is that you get these little shells of atoms around it. Um, this shell is sometimes called a solvation shell. Solvation shell. Although I think that's more of a preview for the next chapter. Okay, so those are all our lovely intermolecular forces. Uh, let us draw or let us consider then sort of the interaction between the intermolecular forces and sort of energy. So intermolecular forces and energy. And we said that we're kind of sloppy. Do you want me to go back for a second, Haley? Salvation shell. That's a V in there. Kind of like salvation, but with an O, salvation. Like, you've heard the term solvent, right? So salvation shell. So intermolecular forces and energy, or we said in this class that we're a little bit sloppy, so we'll talk about it and just thinking about it in kind of terms of heat. And the idea is that if my intermolecular forces are weaker than the energy available or the heat, or you can even think about it as temperature if you really want, although that's getting even more inaccurate to really talk about it that way, then something's going to be a solid. Meaning there's not enough energy. Oops, I'm sorry. I, I said it the right way. I wrote it. Wait. Yeah, the inter, I'm sorry. The intermolecular forces are larger than the amount of energy or heat. Got to make sure I do my math right. There's not enough energy to break the intermolecular forces. And most things are solids. And they're held rigidly in place by those hydrogen bonds. Then if the intermolecular forces are kind of about the same as the amount of energy available, or the temperature, if we want to think about it this way, then things are going to be a liquid. Because basically, there's not enough energy to separate the molecules, but there is enough energy to let them move around. So remember when we, way back, I mean seriously, this is like going back to chapter one if I remember right. We're talking about solids, liquids, and gases, right? Solids are held rigidly in place, we said. There's no motion of the atoms and they don't flow. And then as we increase the temperature from a solid, we know that eventually, we, if we add enough energy, then most thing, almost everything turns directly into a liquid and then those molecules can flow around each other, right? And they're constantly in motion. And then, of course, what happens if we add enough energy? Yeah, we get a gas. And so the, I don't have enough room to stick it on this slide, so I'll wait a second since I see people still writing. So what type of cereal do we have this morning? It's oatmeal. 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 It's dinosaur oatmeal? That's some amazing oatmeal. Uh, I like oatmeal occasionally, and I'll just I grind up walnuts in it and put raisins in it, and then some cinnamon and some either honey or sugar. Mm. Okay, last one would be if the intermolecular forces are smaller, or the amount of energy available is greater than the um, intermolecular forces, then of course that means that things are gases, meaning. The intermolecular forces are so weak compared to so weak 
compared to the amount of energy available. Let's see. In the very first one, yes, we had mentioned that. Maybe I should. There, we'll make it big and blue, and here we'll make it a Pac-Man. Even that's how they taught me about greater than and less than. The Pac-Man eats the, or the alligator was the other one I always liked. I heard someone tell me, the point goes towards the smaller number. I'm like, who the hell ever taught you the point goes towards the smaller number? I mean, it's true, but it's not nearly as cool as an alligator or Pac-Man. So, intermolecular forces are so weak compared to the energy available that the atoms don't, don't interact. And so, you know, if you think about a gas, you've got atoms kind of going off every direction. And they don't interact whatsoever. The intermolecular forces are so weak that those molecules, even if they get close to each other, there's enough energy for them to just keep zinging on by. You can think about it maybe as the amount of sugar you give little kids. So, you know, if they've just woken up and they're kind of still sleepy and drowsy, they're just kind of sitting in place like you guys. You guys would represent a solid, right? A little bit of motion. And then, you know, if we fed you all a bunch of sugar and candy and stuff like that, you'd start moving around a little bit, right? And, you know, you might start playing and stuff like that. You have enough energy to just move around and go about it. And then if you overdose those little kids on sugar, oh my God, they just start running around screaming and, you know, running into walls and bouncing off each other and things like that. And so um, it's a pretty good analogy for solids, liquids, and gases, or at least it's as good an analogy as I can come up with. Maybe not as good as the zombie apocalypse, but... It does work. So, for example, and where's my little example? I was going to actually put some real numbers down, but I don't know. My piles of papers here are terribly, terribly misorganized, and so I might not be able to even find anything. So I have two molecules here. We'll just pick these. And then I'll draw the Lewis structure for this one, since while most of you are familiar with the molecule, you're probably not familiar with the Lewis structure, although I think it was actually either on the homework or on that. So, oh, and I guess since it's water, I'll draw its Lewis structure too for fun. The boiling point of water it's, of course, 100 degrees Celsius. We should all know that by heart because you're an alchemist, or at least chemist in training for sure, like chemistry boot camp. So what do you think the boiling point of that other molecule is based on what we've just been talking about? is actually going to be lower. And it really is about 80 degrees Celsius. So the idea here is, remember, this molecule can form two hydrogen bonds, right? This molecule can only form one hydrogen bond because there's only one OH group. Oops, H bond, not on. And so we expect this molecule to have stronger intermolecular forces. Therefore, a higher boiling point. This one has weaker intermolecular forces. Therefore, a lower boiling point. And then what if I drew one more molecule? What if I draw this? And I guess I should have just made sure it was actually you know, there was actually room for it. Oops. This is also something that you'll at least recognize the name when I, oh, I forgot to put this up. This is, of course, ethanol. Ugh, can't write.
great to save my life. Ethanol. And you'll recognize the last one too. What do we expect its boiling point to be? Now I have to admit, you do have you know three choices. It can either be lower, higher, or about the same, meaning you know so tough to tell apart. Um, on the test, of course, you also for this chapter when it comes, which is after Thanksgiving, so you'll have forgotten I ever said this anyway. But you know you do have a 33% chance to guess the right answer, and then of course most of the points are on the explain part. So 33% chance. Who's feeling lucky? Yeah, lower. Its boiling point is about 35 degrees Celsius. And the reason for that is because there's no hydrogen bonds. And at best, there's a very weak dipole-dipole because there is that oxygen there. So there's a very weak dipole-dipole. You guys all with me so far? Um, what I guess the conclusion to that would be simply that boiling points and melting points are proportional to the uh, intermolecular forces. That's what that little proportional symbol means, right? Proportional to. Am I doing a good job at talking slow today or not? I can't tell. I, you know, I'm trying to just be a little bit relaxed. I haven't had that much coffee. I'm a little sleepy. OK, so let's kind of move on. We're going to draw a big graph. And we're going to draw kind of a big graph. And we're going to put a whole lot of information on it. The graph is in your book. Um, did anyone actually bring a book today? If you pop it out, I'll tell you what page. And. So you know, if, when you're writing your notes, you want to completely reproduce the graph. If you didn't bring your book, it may be a good idea. If you did bring your book and you don't want to completely reproduce it, then you, know, you don't have to. So Owen, you're the winner since, well, I guess your book is farther away. If you're following along, now my picture is going to be better. It's going to have a lot more information. But what you'll find is that if you read that section of the book, it also has that same information in it. And so what we want to draw is a big old graph. So this is temperature. And this is going to be heat added. And I'm going to put lots of numbers on the graph. Realize that all of the numbers on the graph are not anything that you have to memorize because you would always get those on a cheat sheet, OK? And then we're going to use, for our example, water. So here's 0 degrees Celsius on my chart. And we'll put 100 degrees Celsius up here. So if I have water, or water that starts off right here. What happens if I start adding heat to it? So basically, it's ice right there, right? This little point on the graph. What's going to happen to it? Now, does it immediately melt? Yeah, so what happens is as I'm adding heat, the temperature increases. And so here, we've got a solid at this temperature. And what happens is, as we add heat or energy, the molecules vibrate more and more. Molecules absorb it and vibrate. And they begin to rotate in place. So you know, as we're adding energy, we're adding motion, basically, to these particles. And then, of course, at 0 degrees Celsius, what do we call that? Yeah, it's either the freezing point or sometimes we call it the 
melting point, depending upon which direction we're going, right? It's the freezing point if we're going from a liquid to a solid. It's the melting point if we're going from a solid to a liquid. But it's the same temperature, right? It's the same point on the graph. Now, here's what's strange and what a lot of people don't realize that, you know, if you have ice at zero degrees Celsius and you add energy to it, what happens to it? It melts, right? But does the temperature immediately start increasing? No, like for instance, if you think about a glass of ice water with ice cubes in it, right? As long as there's ice cubes in that water, that water stays cold, right? The temperature doesn't really increase. And so as we're adding heat, there's actually a plateau here where we are, all the energy goes to essentially breaking or, well, I guess maybe we better say weakening because we haven't broken them really, weakening the intermolecular forces between or between atoms, or between molecules, sorry. Is that actually large enough to read? Because I really am trying to write small because I've got to fit it all on the graph. And this is where we have a solid plus a liquid coexisting. And we have a special term for the energy required to make that. It's called the heat of fusion. It's sometimes given the symbol delta HF. So delta H just stands for enthalpy. It's a fancy chemistry way of saying energy and heat. Uh, there's technically little minor differences between the two. Not important in this class. If you want to learn that stuff, go take Chem 111. That's kind of what they're covering right now. And it's a, the energy to convert one gram of solid to one gram of liquid at its melting point. And for water, and this is where you don't have to remember the value, it's 335 joules per gram. The reason I'm telling you the value is because we want to compare that to sort of the other values for water. Okay, so what happens eventually when all the ice is melted? Yeah, it turns into a liquid, and then all the energy is going to increase the temperature of the liquid. So this is liquid, and basically the energy goes to increasing the motion of the molecules, motion of the H2O molecules, since we're talking about water. And remember, this applies to anything, right? It's not just water. And that is translated to basically an increase in the temperature. Now, think about it. We've uh, used or measured the energy change in water when it changes temperature, right? That was the calorimetry lab. What equation did we use to describe that? From chapter 4? Yeah. So this is where we use Q equals ms delta T. So remember, this was the amount of energy. This was our mass. Delta T was the change in temperature of the liquid, or it was the change in temperature of the solid. And then S is, of course, the specific heat. Do we remember the specific heat for water off the top of our head, anyone? Joules per gram degree Celsius. I'm impressed. You guys remembered that. Now, of course, what happens when water hits 100 degrees Celsius? Yeah, it boils. Now, it doesn't immediately all turn from instantly sol or liquid to gas. And so this is where liquid and gas coexist, kind of like solid and liquid coexist. And so here, all the energy goes to breaking those intermolecular forces or overcoming the intermolecular forces. And then, of course, we also call this point what? The boiling point. Does anyone know what we call it if we're going the other direction? No, most people don't. I don't I think anyone ever uses it, not even chemists. Hmm? It's the condensation point. Because water is, or wait, yeah, gas is condensing to liquid. I've never heard anyone actually use it. I've heard it used. Yeah, I don't use it too much. And then, of course, at some point, we're all a gas, and then we have just that gas. Now. Just like we have a heat of fusion, I forgot to point out, 
at that liquid to gas range, we have what's called the heat of vaporization. And that's given the symbol delta H sub V or VAP usually. And that has a value of 2.26 kilojoules per gram. So notice that it's considerably larger than water. So to, to melt an equivalent volume of ice to water takes a lot less energy than to take the equivalent volume of liquid and convert it to a gas. Notice one of them is 335 joules per gram. The other one is 2.26 kilograms, or kilo, sorry, kilojoules per gram of water. It takes a ton of water. One of the things, or one of the reasons why, like for instance, you know, getting hit by boiling water, I mean it hurts, okay? I'm not going to say it doesn't. But if you get hit by the equivalent amount of boiling steam or steam, it contains a huge amount of energy compared to just boiling water. And you know, you can get flash burns very, very easily. And so the steam is much more dangerous than, say, boiling water. Uh, let's see. Do I have got those values down? Uh, we should point out, and I'm going to use a different color. So this equation here, Q equals MS delta T, what that does is that explains, or that describes, I guess, it's not really explaining anything, or it mathematically describes the change in temperature of a solid, liquid, or gas as energy is added. And so that corresponds to the sloped parts of the graph. We'd use that equation there. We'd use the equation way over here. And that also describes a gas. And there's a different S value for each of them. The S value is different for each phase. And I'm trying to find on my page of random notes what it is for those other two phases. But it may be that we just never really care about them. And so we don't use them ever, which is fine by me. It doesn't. Hey, look, I found my data for water and making my pretty graph for that. We'll do that next, just as a random thing. Gosh, man, I should have found these earlier. Then I wouldn't have had to make all this shit up. Hopefully, I got most of it right. And then we have another form of the equation that describes phase transitions. So, and I'm going to put that on a new slide because, gosh, this is way too complicated. So, I should have put that in a separate color. Oh, well, here, we'll do this. We'll outline it in green. Nope, didn't even change colors. Stupid ink pen. Like this. So phase transitions describe the flat parts of the line. Am I good to go on changing the slide or wait a minute? OK, so for, for phase transitions, we basically have Q equals M delta H of either vaporization or Q equals M delta H of fusion. So notice that we have two different equations. For phase transitions, that's the flat parts of the line. And then we have when we're simply just heating a solid, liquid, or gas, that's those cur or diagonal parts of the line where we use Q equals MS delta T. A nice part about this chapter is we get to review chapter 4 and have questions on the test from chapter 4. Okay, now, you go, uh, well, I actually think if I remember right, chapter 4, a lot of people did very good with these equations. And I should point out that the chapter 4 versions of it are a lot more complicated than anything we do in the chapter you know, 13 and 14 test version. But it's nice to review something from that far back simply because it shows up on the final. So let's look at an example problem. How much energy? And then I think we'll quit after this example because we'll be out of time. I'll do one more thing maybe. How much energy is required to melt, well, to transform a snowball weighing 200 point grams 
at zero degrees Celsius to steam at oops, 100 degrees Celsius. And I'll go back and I'll add a couple more sig figs to my temperature, 0, 0.0 degrees Celsius, so that our answer at least has how many sig figs? Yeah, actually, yeah, two. Something like that. Not really worried about sig figs. Maybe I'll go back and I'll double check it. So what I want you guys to use or to think about is that table or that graph that we just drew. So, you know, I want you to visualize this. And then I also want you to visual. I'll have to visualize that thing. <laughs> well, you have it in your notes. So anyway, and then I want you to remember the two equations. And so when we're looking at a problem like this, realize that, you know, if we sketch that graph real quick here for those of you that are annoying, we're starting at a snowball at zero degrees Celsius, right? And so if I sketch that graph, it looks like this, like this, like this, like this, right? So where I'm starting on that graph is right there, right? So that's my snowball at zero degrees Celsius, and we know a snowball is a solid. And so then I'm going here, and so I have to melt it. And so eventually I have liquid water at zero degrees Celsius. And I'll switch to a different color, just because I can. Then we've got this process going on here, where we heat the water from 0 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius. And then we have one last process where, oops, I already used that color. Find something better. I like this blue. It's pretty. Then we're going to have this process where we basically take H2O liquid at 100 degrees Celsius, and we have to convert it to H2O gas at 100 degrees Celsius. So notice we really have a three-step process that we have to do. We have to melt it, we have to heat it, and we have to boil it, basically. And so what that means is that we've got three steps or three equations we use to solve this problem. We've got that step one equation, which is going from a solid to a liquid at zero degrees Celsius, and they're both zero degrees Celsius. We've got step two, where we're going to go from a liquid at zero degrees Celsius to a liquid at 100 degrees Celsius. And we've got step three, where we have a liquid at 100 degrees Celsius, and we're going to a gas at 100 degrees Celsius. So notice that we're using some parts of the line, some parts we're using, we're going to use the equation that's the flat part. So the very first one we have to use Q equals delta H M, or I guess I wrote it as M delta H of fusion. And then at the end, we need to use Q equals M delta H of vaporization. And in the middle, we use Q equals MS delta T. So one question three pieces of work to do. And I'll wait a second. I see people scribbling down. But if you can picture that chart, and then when there's a question on the test that says, you know, melt a snowball or freeze a snowball or do whatever with a snowball or whatever else I come up with as a funny way to rephrase the question, not even funny way, just different way to rephrase the question, you can figure out which ones of these equations and kind of how many of them you need to use to solve the problem. Oh, he's about ready to go back to bed. Ugh. So Jay has another exciting lecture to give, and then several exciting meetings to go to. Yeah, I know. One, I, I, I have mentioned one of my pet peeves is students that don't have much to do that get to go take naps all the time. I wish. It was all the time. I had one year, I don't remember, but I think the girl had an hour and a half break after my class every day or something. And she'd be like, I'm going to take a nap. And I'm like, I hate you. I did at the very beginning. Now I don't have time for that shit. 
What does what say? Q equals M delta H of vaporization. VAP. Okay, so let's go ahead and do those three equations. So equation one, we're just using Q equals M delta H of fusion. And so we said that we have, well, we'll do it this way so we can all fit it in. We have 200 grams. And if we remember right, we said that the value was, uh, where is it, 335 joules per gram. So we plug that into our calculator and get 67,000 joules if we keep two sig figs. Actually, we can keep more for this since there's no change in temperature. I'm just going to stick it with two because we know our final answer is only going to have two sig figs probably. Actually, that's probably not even true either, but I don't care this morning. Okay, part two, we're going to use our good old friend Q equals MS delta T. So we've got 200.0 grams times S, which is 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. And then our change in temperature is 100 point degrees Celsius. Actually, it's, let's see, if it was really 100 point minus, yeah, it'd be 100 point. So actually, we can really get to three sig figs if we want. Oh, well. Such is life. 84,000 joules. We'll just round everything to two sig figs. Two sig figs because Jay doesn't care. And then the third one, we're using that equation Q equals M delta H of vaporization. So we still have our 200 grams. And here, though, we're using the value 2.26 kilojoules per gram. And since some of the values are in joules and some of them are in kilojoules, I'm going to go ahead and convert and say one kilojoule is 1,000 joules. And so we get 450,000 joules. That's just, that would be like, on your cheat sheet or given in the problem. It was one of the, it was the value we gave for delta H of vaporization on the graph back a couple pages. Same thing with the 335 joules per gram, meaning these values like here are our cheat sheet. Yep, you just have to know how to use them or find them or something. Again, that's on your cheat sheet. And So you don't have to memorize conversion factors ever. And then, of course, the total amount of energy is just the sum of all those. And so what do we got? 67,000 plus 84,000 plus 450,000 is 601,000 joules. No, that can't. Well, maybe that's right. It is. Oh, I was looking at my notes, and I don't know why, but I have the wrong number written in my notes. And the, the reason I was pulling my calculator out is because it can't be what it possibly is. That's got to be at least a little five there. Now, of course, I'd have it scribble out in my notes, so I can't even read it at all. We'll rewrite the notes some year. So notice that the most of the energy is really going to convert liquid to gas. It really does take an exceptionally large amount of energy to go from a liquid to a gas in the case of water and for most substances. Uh, one last thing that I said I should mention, and we were looking at, and these are all words, that most of these words you guys already know. For instance, if we look at that transition from solid to liquid. If I'm going from a solid to a liquid, like the top arrow there, what do we call that again? If you, if I, if you, yeah, melting. So you already know that, right? And what if I'm going from a liquid to a solid? No, condensation was a gas to a liquid. Yeah, freezing. Now, what if I take a look at 
liquid between liquid and gas. You know, it's weird. I write the li the L in liquid as a s as like a cursive L because that's how you use it in equations. But all the other letters are normal. So what do we go going from a liquid to a gas? So this is evaporation, or sometimes you'll hear it referred to as vaporization. And we've already said it, but what's a gas going back to a liquid? Yeah. The way I remember condensation, conden usually is I think what happens on my mirror when I take a shower water condenses because of the steam from my hot shower does that make any sense yeah. most of you have at least taken a shower right <laughs> yeah or water condenses on a can on a hot summer day or on a glass what yeah we can tell I feel sorry for Brittany and the, the last one the one that's a little strange that most people don't really know about or think about is it is possible to go straight from a solid to a gas. Um, the best example of this is most people have heard of dry ice, right? What dry ice is is it's really just CO2 solid, so carbon dioxide solid. And we know that why it's called dry ice is because dry ice goes straight from a solid to a gas and it never turns into a liquid in between, does it? And then another example of that, which maybe you guys are too young for, but um, is mothballs. One of the reasons mothballs are used is because you know you put the solid mothball in there, and then it doesn't melt; it actually just turns into a vapor, and that's what keeps the or drives the moths away. They're, I don't know if they're allergic to it or what the deal is, but like yeah, and it smells nasty. I don't like them anyway. I'd rather have moths, frankly. Uh, does anyone know what the process of going from a solid? Why the hell would you have that much money invested in a single piece of clothing? Anyway, solid going to a gas. Does anyone know what that process is called? It's called sublimation. So the key here is you guys are going to have to memorize these six. Of them, <coughs> excuse me, three of them or four of them are pretty easy and obvious, and the other two are the ones that are weird. And then does anyone know what happens if we go from a gas straight to a solid? Um, kind of close actually, but no. It's a good guess. It's called deposition. I well, that's kind of what I the way I think about it. The gas deposits the solid on the surface. I don't know. We don't use it very often. It's not something you encounter terribly much, where something goes straight from a gas to a solid without going through the liquid stays stage. I, it was too, too quiet to, for me to hear and laugh at, so I'm not going to worry. Um, one last thing that we can mention, uh, because I did find the numbers in my notes, and it does show that trend. Remember when we made that graph with H2O, H2S, H2TSE, and H2TE? If we look at the delta H of vaporization, which is, again, it's a measure of, or it's proportional to, the intermolecular forces, right? Because it's describing the energy to go from a liquid to a gas, right? That means breaking those intermolecular forces. Well, if you take a look at H2TE, it's 179 um, joules per gram. If you look at H2TE, it's 238 because, or H2SE. If you look at H2S, it's 548. And if you look at water, it's 2.26 times 10 to the third joules per gram. So notice that there's a huge increase, huge, there we go, increase. I feel like I'm yelling at you as I'm writing in large capital letters. Basically because of the ability to form H bonds. Okay, it is 9 o'clock. Yay, we're done. Have a lovely weekend. Um, if people want to ask questions, I am not going anywhere this weekend. So if people want to set up a time to come by and visit, we can probably arrange some.